Okay, this lesson we're going to talk about three major concepts that are very, very closely related. The concepts of heat energy, specific heat capacity, and calorimetry. So we just finished talking about the kinetic molecular theory and how gases, liquids, and solids differ in the kinetic molecular theory based on just how much energy they have. So when we're talking about energy, we typically are talking about heat energy, and that's the energy of kinetic motion. The units that we're going to typically use for that are going to be the units of joules and kilojoules. Now, joules and kilojoules are the SI units. However, that's not the unit that we commonly use in our everyday lives. The everyday way that we obtain energy is through eating. And the unit of energy on our food is the calorie, the capital C, which is different than a calorie with a lowercase c. A capital C calorie is a thousand of these little c calories that are mentioned here in this chart. And the translation from one to the other unit is provided to you in this chart. And the reason we have to translate them is that uh, when we're going to do our calculations with heat, what we're actually going to obtain using the Celsius scale is going to be a measure in joules. So let's try an example problem where we are asked to convert. First, very easily problem here. If we look at the problem described where we have 343 joules. 343 joules, 2 kilojoules, is a very simple conversion. 343 joules, 2 kilojoules, we're going to divide by 1,000. Another way of saying divide by 1,000 is move the decimal spot, or decimal point, 3 spots to the left. So 343 joules is point, I'm sorry, 543 joules is 0.543 kilojoules. Now the other little bit that we have to do is to go from joules to calories. In this case here, we're going to divide by 4.184. When we take 65 and we divide it by 4.184, we find that there are 15.54 calories in a 65 joules. Now it's important to understand that a calorie, a little c calorie, is the amount of heat energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now again, this is not a food calorie. A food calorie is a thousand of these right here. Um, part of the reason for that, I suppose, is probably to eliminate a lot of those very big numbers on the food packages that we would consume. All right, let's move on to the concept of specific heat capacity. Uh, when you talk about heat, you have to talk about what you're heating. And specific heat capacity has a major role in that. When we're talking specific heat capacity, we're talking about the amount of heat required to raise one gram of any substance by one degree Celsius. This is different than the definition of a calorie in that we're talking about any substance. And this is a unique and constant value. So it's important to know that because these are constant values, they can be obtained by looking them up on the Internet. The specific heat value of each substance is constant and can therefore be another um, unit that we can use to identify what substance we're dealing with. In much the same way that the atomic number helps us to identify an element, the specific heat capacity could also help us identify that element. The unit that we typically use in our class for specific heat capacity is joules per gram times degree Celsius. Uh, but you're going to see this unit um, other places on the internet. They're going to be expressed in different ways. For example, you might have calories per um, gram um, degrees, or I'm not degrees, but Kelvin. Um, that's, there are other units out there, but what you're basically ending up with is a unit of energy on top over a mass times temperature unit on the bottom. Um, specific heat capacity can be used to think about the way that water is at different times of the year. For example, our weather has been fantastic lately. We've had very, very warm weather around here. But if we were wanting to go out and swim right now in, say, Lake Lanier, we would find that the water itself is not very warm yet. Despite having 80 degree days outside, the water takes a very long time to heat up. This is due to the fact that water has a very, very high specific heat capacity. Water heats up very slowly, but it also cools down very slowly. So if you're reaching the end of your summer, heading off into the, the cooler fall, and you just really want that one more day of swimming in the lake, you might jump in the water and be surprised to find that despite the air temperature being around 50 degrees, the water temperature still is much, much warmer. Again, due to the fact that water retains its heat energy for a long time. 
These two concepts, heat and specific heat, come together with the idea or the equation of Q equals CM delta T. As we saw on a previous slide, E and Q are used pretty much interchangeably. Q tends to mean the energy that's transferred. We can't directly measure energy. However, we can, enter, or we can measure energy on its movement. So if we're talking purely about energy, we're talking about E. If we're talking about the movement of energy, we're talking about Q, and that's where we are with this. So Q in this equation is going to be our heat. And when we solve this equation, we're going to be solving heat for joules. C is our specific heat capacity. And remember, this is a constant value, and it's dependent on our, sub, or our, our material. So remember, this is our C, and that's going to be in joules per gram degree Celsius. A constant value you can find by looking it up. All you need to know is which substance you have. M is mass, and the mass unit that we're expressing this in is going to match the unit in our constant for specific heat. And that's going to be grams. Delta T can be a bit tricky, especially when we're trying to solve for one of the parts. Delta T is T final minus T initial. So delta T is actually the change in temperature. And hopefully you guessed the unit of that. So it's a change in temperature, and that's going to be in units of degrees Celsius. So let's try one of those specific heat problems and try to identify the parts. I always recommend that you list out all of your variables, Q, C, M, and again, delta T, which can be broken down into T final and T initial. Please understand that a negative Q value is not a bad thing. A negative Q value simply states to us that we're going to have energy that's, being, that's leaving the system. However, in this particular problem, it says that we're absorbing that heat. Therefore, we can actually assume that it's going to be a positive value for Q. So let's read the problem. How much heat does 23 grams of granite rock absorb as its temperature increases from 7, negative 17.4 degrees Celsius to 12? Okay. What are we going to be looking for here? Well, the question how much heat tells us that we're going to be looking for Q. 23 grams is a measure of mass. Granite tells us what we need to look up for our specific heat. And when we look up that value, we find that granite has a specific heat capacity of 0 0.803 joules per gram degree Celsius. The toughest part from this is figuring out what is our final temperature and what's our initial temperature. So as we look at this here, we're going from 17.4 to 12. So 12 is going to be our final temperature. Negative 17.4 is our initial temperature. 12 minus negative 17.4 gives us a value of delta T equaling 29.4 degrees Celsius. Now it's simply a matter of crunching your numbers together. Q is equal to 0.803 times 23 times 29.4. When you multiply these values together, you find Q being equal to 542.99 joules. The granite must absorb 542.99 joules of heat energy to increase its temperature that much. The last concept that we're going to talk upon is calorimetry. And calorimetry is simply the study of what we just did. If you were to want to measure how much heat is moving away from that granite, or from a metal in this particular example, you could not simply measure it in air. Instead, you'd have to use a device called a calorimeter. And a calorimeter measures the amount gained and lost. So if we take this hot metal and we place it into water inside this calorimeter, two things will simultaneously happen. One, the water will heat up. Two, the metal will cool down. Now it is very important to note that this will take place until both have reached the same final temperature. And that's a key important point. They will both have the same final temperature. 
the same T file. Despite the fact that they had different initial temperatures, they will eventually balance out and they will equal, come to an equal temperature equilibrium. And that's one of the fundamental understanding points about calorimetry. So let's look at a calorimetry problem. A 50.6 gram iron sample is heated and put into 104 grams of water at 19.7 degrees Celsius in a calorimeter. If the final temperature of both is 24.3 Celsius, what is, sorry, the heat energy produced? This problem here at first appears to contain way too much information. So let's sort it out. Let's say we have iron over here. Let's say we have water over here. All we want to know is the heat energy produced, which means we only have to have enough information on one of these two to run this equation for Q. Okay, so we'll list these out. We know we're going to be looking for Q on either side of the problem. So that would be a question mark here. It would be a question mark here. fifty point six grams of iron well that falls under the category of red so that goes right here fifty point six but if we look carefully we have hundred and four grams of water so we could also put that over here the water starts at nineteen point seven degrees celsius now the important part to note here is that they both have a final temperature of twenty four point three so that while we know the final temperature of the iron, we don't know its initial temperature, which means we're not going to have enough information to run our equation off of iron's information. However, by taking 24.3, subtracting 19.7, we find a final temp or a temperature difference of 4.6 degrees Celsius, and we can look up the constant value for water of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So calorimetry problems a lot of times are about finding which one you have enough information on and getting rid of all the extra superfluous information. When we run this equation to completion, we find that we are going to actually transfer 2001.63 joules. One of the questions that came up on Twitter is, well, what happens if um, the amount of heat transferred is not equal? Well, and that's a very valid question. You would have to chalk that up to air. Remember, when you transfer that heat, you're transferring it into a calorimeter, and a calorimeter is a styrofoam cup. There will be some heat loss. We assume zero heat loss, even though this is not going to be completely correct. I know this is a long video, but this will help us with our understanding for our lab tomorrow. We'll see you in class.